開始啦嚇。誒、uh, 早晨，各位同 Good morning, members. We have a quorum, and this is the appointed time. So I call this meeting to order. That is a meeting of the panel on security. This meeting is conducted via Zoom. And may I remind members before we begin, please use the appropriate color to show the virtual background on your screen. And during the meeting, please make sure that the video camera is on. Whereas、uh, our secretariat will be responsible for switching on your mics. First item: information papers issued since the last meeting. No information paper has been issued. Second item: items for discussion at the next meeting. Please refer to the list of outstanding items of discussion on the twenty eighth of January. The deputy chair and myself had a meeting with the secretary for security to. I know the work plan for our panel in 2022, and members also raised issues of their concern at the meeting of the 25th of January. These issues and items have been put under the list of outstanding items for discussion. But then, after considering the list, I find some items not related to the terms of reference of our panel. So. For youth develop、uh, youth education on national security, this issue will now be referred to the、uh, Constitution Affairs Panel.、Um, then online crowdfunding to Financial Affairs Panel, and combating fake news and legislation against insulting a public officer. These items will be referred to the Home Affairs Panel, and for importation of、um, talents. Well, the item has been referred to the manpower panel. I have asked the secretariat to follow this instruction to refer these items to the respective panels and invite members of the panel on security to attend those meetings when they are called. As for the regular meeting, the next regular meeting in March is scheduled for the first of March, twenty twenty two, two thirty p.m. The Security Bureau has proposed to discuss the following items: first, non-reformment claims implementation and establishment subcommittee proposal; second item. Um, the legislative proposal to amend the births and deaths registration ordinance, and third item enhancing the information technology systems of the Immigration Department and the Correctional Services Department. The ICAC also proposes to discuss an establishment com com、um, proposal to create a senior assistant director and a an assistant director post, which are supernumerary posts. As these items are quite urgent, we propose to discuss all four items in the March regular meeting. And as a result, we will have to extend the meeting next time by about half an hour, which means that the next meeting will be adjourned around 5 p.m. No problem. Now,、um, in March. The NPC and CPPCC may、um, have a plenary session, and on a preliminary check, our schedule、uh, will still be able to cope with it. But otherwise,、uh, we may have to reschedule meetings. If my memory is correct, there are six to seven members of this panel who are also the relevant delegates, and we need to make sure we have everybody here for our next meeting. Third item: briefing by the Secretary for Security on the Chief Executive's 2021 policy address. All members of the Legislative Council have been invited to take part in this item, and if you want to speak, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. And I will ask the clerk to. Check the list of members who would like to speak. So, how about、uh, I invite the Secretary for Security, Mr. P. 
PK Tang to deliver his opening remarks. And meanwhile, all members can use the raise hand function. We'll do a count and then we'll open the floor for questions. Secretary, are you ready? Yes. Chairman members, first of all, I'd like to congratulate Mr. Gary Chan for being returned as chair, who will continue to lead the panel on security in the coming four years. The Security Bureau and all discipline services will surely join hands with members of the panel to create the new landscape for good governance. Today, I'd like to brief members on the initiatives in the 2021 policy address under the Security Bureau's portfolio. And my presentation will focus on four areas. First, safeguarding national security, including two new pieces of legislation and enhancing law-abiding awareness of young people. Second, enhancing fire safety of aged buildings. Three, enhancing border control capability and facilitating the flow of talents within the Greater Bay Area. And four, anti-narcotics work. First, on safeguarding national security, Hong Kong is an inalienable part of our country, and we have the constitutional duty to safeguard national security. Acts and activities endangering national security are serious crimes, which we will definitely prevent, curb, and suppress according to the law. Our law enforcement on, sa on safeguarding national security in the past has substantially reduced national security risk in Hong Kong. However, there are still a small number of hardcore criminals lurking about and seeking opportunities to, to endanger national security, and we will let them feel the full force of the law. In view of the threat of domestic terrorism, we remain highly vigilant against lone wolf terrorist attacks and those advocating Hong Kong independence via softer means, such as encouraging, infiltrating, inciting terrorist activities. The Interdepartmental Counterterrorism Unit will enhance its response capability and take resolute enforcement action. We will step up public education publicity to ensure safety of Hong Kong and our country. On legislation on Article 23 of the Basic Law, we are taking forward proactively the enactment of local legislation to implement Article 23 of the Basic Law so as to fulfill our constitutional duty as soon as possible. We will make reference to past studies, implementation experience of the Hong Kong National Security Law and relevant court verdict, as well as the actual circumstances in Hong Kong, with a view to drawing up effective and pragmatic proposals and provisions. Our goal is to launch the public consultation before the end of this term of government and table the bill into legal before the end of this year. On enacting cyber security legislation, in light of increased cyber attacks in recent years, there have been significant security challenges to critical information infrastructure. If the CII is disrupted or damaged by cyber attacks, they may even cause serious harm to the economy, people's livelihood, public safety, and even national security. We must step up cyber security to keep our business environment safe. The government will start preparatory work for the enactment of cybersecurity legislation. And we will define the responsibility of um, service providers and will consult the sectors and the public on the proposal. On enhancing the law-abiding awareness of young people to help young people develop positive thinking and law-abiding awareness, the six discipline services and the two auxiliary services under the SB will enhance the youth engagement work through different activities and models. The latest development includes the Fire amb and Ambulance Services Teen Connect or Fast Connect established by the Fire Services Department in December last year. Its objective is to help young people build their fine character as well as understand more about our motherland through a wide range of practical training programs. The Correctional Services Department joined hands with the Hong Kong Police Force in implementing the Walk with Youth program to enhance law abiding awareness of young people in custody. The CSD is also preparing to establish a youth lab and a change lab to strengthen the values, moral, and civic education for young offenders and rehabilitated offenders. Second area, enhancing fire safety of buildings. Fire safety of aged buildings is a common concern in our community. The Fire Safety Buildings Ordinance was enacted in 2007. The Fire Services Department and the Buildings Departments have been sparing no effort in enforcing the law and providing owners of aged buildings technical and financial support, including fire safety improvement works subsidy scheme. However, some aged buildings, such as three new buildings, are not properly managed. To further enhance the fire safety of buildings, we will amend the Fire Safety Buildings Ordinance based on the existing mechanism under the Buildings Ordinance to empower the Fire Services Department and the Buildings Department to carry out fire safety improvement works for owners of non-compliant old composite and domestic buildings and then 
recover the costs and fees on completion of works. We aim to launch a public consultation this year. Third area, enhancing border control capability and facilitating the flow of talents within the Greater Bay Area. At the Legislative Council meeting of the 24th of March 2021, members gave unanimous support to the government's motion to take forward the development of Wangang Port to facilitate the connectivity of infrastructure facilities in the Greater Bay Area. The two governments have started discussion on the design of the Hong Kong Port Area and implementation of a new clearance mode of collaborative inspection and joint clearance with a view to commencing the construction of the new port building as early as practicable. To facilitate the flow of talent within Greater Bay Area, we are actively following up the issue with mainland authorities for Greater Bay Area visa endorsement to be granted to business and quality talents traveling to and from the Greater Bay Area. It will also facilitate non-Chinese nationals residing in Hong Kong to travel to Greater Bay Area for business, research, exchanges and visits. The fourth area is anti-narcotics work. On combating narcotics, in recent years, a variety of cannabidiol CBD products emerging in the local market. The wide availability of CBD products has undermined the public's awareness of the harmful effects of cannabis. In general, CBD is extracted from cannabis, and such products may contain THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, a dangerous drug. The government has zero tolerance towards dangerous drugs. To safeguard public health, we plan to list CBD as a controlled substance under the Dangerous Drugs Ordinance and will proceed to legislation within 2022. Chairman, these are the work priorities of the Security Bureau in 2022. Before taking members' questions, I'd like to take this opportunity to explain the anti-epidemic work carried out by the Security Bureau and the Discipline Services. Apart from assisting the Restriction Testing Declaration or RTD operations, we also provide assistance in the management of the Penny's Bay Quarantine Center and seven designated quarantine hotels. In addition, 400 discipline services staff have been seconded to take up the work full-time uh, of uh, contact tracing. Also. We, on a regular basis, deploy discipline services staff to assist other departments, including the Department of Health, Housing Department, and the Home Affairs Department. Our line of work requires us to enter contaminated zones or come into contact with high-risk individuals or even those infected. Therefore, we are very mindful about the anti-epidemic equipment and training for our colleagues as we need to ensure their safety. Chairman, that concludes our report. My team and myself will be happy to take questions from members. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary. Well, we also have in attendance the Permanent Secretary for Security, Mr. Carroll Yip, Mr. Sunny Ao, Under Secretary for Security, as well as Mr. Kasson Lee, Commissioner for Narcotics. Fourteen members have indicated uh, that they wish to speak. And I can only give each member three minutes, questions and answers included. So please be as succinct as possible when you when it's your turn. I'll read out the list. Jimmy Ng, Ronick Chen, Michael Tian, Ng Ki Chong, Wong Shun Sing, Ma Fung Kwok, Nam Sun Kang, Lai Tong Kwok, Deputy Chair, Elizabeth Kwok, Chairman K, Chairman Kwong, Ken Wai Men, Tang Bill Tang, and um, finally myself. We start with Mr. Jimmy Ng, three minutes, questions and answers included. Thank you. First of all, I need to acknowledge the Bureau's effort in their work to safeguard national security and uh, combat terrorism. I understand from the paper that in order to enhance the law-abiding awareness of our citizens and a sense of national security, we need to uh, make sure young people have a positive thing thinking and the correct values. I want to know exactly what measures are involved and are there indicators uh, laid down for these measures and whether your strategy uh, will be affected by the uh, epidemic. Now, you also mentioned the number of young people uh, taking cannabis in uh, in 2019 and 2020, and that uh, the number of uh, abuses uh, rose by 30 percent, and more people were getting arrested. And you need to make sure that uh, people understand the harm of uh, cannabis. 
Now, in terms of the latest publicity strategy targeting young people, will you consider enlisting the help of uh, young celebrities and idols, uh, KOLs, etc.? Yeah, 所以除了以往我們警隊裡面的少年警訊之外或者我們搞個活動的數目例如我們最近剛剛準備推出一個API 陳議員你的聲音好像有點雜 Okay, so I would like to know whether you would try to use some of the cases and then produce some documentaries and have similar promotion measures in Hong Kong so that they can be broadcast in schools and then we can show them to our students. Also, in the same paragraph, it is um, mentioned that there has been spread of hatred and there are activities trying to advocate violence. Um, the Commissioner has been saying that there are facilities which are being imported into Hong Kong, uh, for example, like magazines who are trying to incite such a local terrorism. So I would like to know what measures can be adopted to prevent uh, such measures, especially through the uh, cultural activities and then also the uh, publications and maybe video games. So whether there are any measures that we can be adopted? So uh, the questions are all about combating local terrorism. Uh, Secretary, can you get the questions clearly? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Well, first about the uh, promotion against uh, combating local terrorism. And we will try to introduce measures, for example, to uh, prevent uh, such incidents from happening. Secondly, as to how to uh, move away people from thinking of uh, adopting local terrorism. So we have been working with the department's concern. Uh, for example, at schools, we've been trying to promulgate such messages. And we are aware of uh, Mr. Chen's views, and we will take that into account as to what appropriate measures can be adopted. For example, we may be producing some uh, 
publicity materials. Um, secondly, as regards the Customs Department, as to how we can intercept materials promulgating local terrorism. If we are uh, aware of um, such materials, um, that they may be endangering national security and advocating independence of Hong Kong, we will try to intercept them. But for the moment, we are not aware of uh, such a situation, but we will pay attention to this area, and we will continue with our work in this aspect. Mr. Chen, any follow-up questions? You still have some time? No? Thank you. Mr. Michael Tin, then followed by Mr. M. Johnny M. Mm. Chairman, can you hear me? Yes. Secretary, you have been saying that we should try to tackle fake news, uh, but we are not aware of whether there is any legal measures to do so. Uh, the chairman has just been saying that the issue will be referred to the Home Affairs Bureau, but I have never heard about that before. Well, Secretary, since you are here today, can you tell us whether your bureau will participate in this matter? Um, we have to ensure that we have freedom of speech while tackling such measures. But uh, there is a lot of fake news floating around. Uh, people can try to ask people to use electric fans to try to drive the viruses away, saying that this is from Dr. Yun Kwok Yong. Um, and then there are people lining up for a long time for the testing. But then there are extracts saying that the CD has refused to ask for assistance from the central authorities. So every day we've been receiving a lot of news, and we don't know whether they are fake or not. So Secretary, do you have any response to this situation? Secretary, well, on the legislation to combat fake news, it is stated in the policy address that there has been fake news trying to um, spread hatred. And we are trying to see if we can improve our legal framework to tackle the matter. And this is uh, being led by the Home Affairs Bureau. Uh, but of course, the Secretary Bureau will not be just sitting there. We'll try to provide a lot of input to the HAB uh, so as to how we can enhance our legal framework to curb fake news. You have said that there are a lot of fake news recently about how to tackle COVID-19. And this is, of course, damaging to the work that we've been trying to prevent the disease from spreading in Hong Kong. So we will try to clarify the situation as quickly as possible. Secondly, we will also try to see if whether such acts are in breach of existing legislation. Well, since we do not have uh, existing legislation governing fake news, it doesn't mean that we don't have anything under the current legal framework to tackle it. Um, there may be other legislation current legislation then can be used to tackle the situation. For example, uh, like decepting people or it may be affecting national security. So we'll try to see whether there are provisions under the existing legislation that can be used to address the matter. Well, you've been talking about issues which are important and affect the national security. But what I'm saying is that to fight a virus is a livelihood issue. And it affects everyone of us. And I've been receiving, you know, news from my friends. They are all asking whether such news is genuine or fake, because we will not be able to see clarification from the government uh, instantly. So, is there anything we can do? Is there any existing legislation can can be used to address the matter? Well, I'm. Back to part, and I do not agree with that. Uh, but we have to see what current provisions of the legislation is being breached, for example, concerning deception. Uh, sorry, Mr. Michael Tin, your time is up. I'll ask the Secretary to give a brief response. I think we have to look at the individual circumstances. I think, as a whole, we cannot say. Uh, how we should tackle the situation. But if we have a particular case, we'll try to see what are the circumstances, and then we'll see what existing legal provisions can be used. Uh, I think people should pay attention to the uh, news promulgated by the government on how to tackle COVID. Dr. Donnie Ng. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, paragraph 9 of the paper has been talking about the rehabilitation of persons in custody. I know the CSD has been providing uh, vocational training for persons in custody. Following the uh, 
protests in 2019, a lot of the offenders are facing the penalty. So I would like to know whether there are young people who are in the 20s. Uh, is there any vocational training for them so that they can be reintegrated into society after that? And if yes, what are the details? Uh, Secretary, thank you, Chairman. Uh, for the PICs, especially the young offenders, um, they have to go to jail because of the radical protests in the 2019. So we've been trying to enhance measures to enhance their law abiding awareness of these young PICs. We have a new measure, um, a new program called Understanding History is the Beginning of Knowledge, uh, so as to enable the young offenders uh, to learn not just the school curriculum, but also through workshops and also through other experiences, they will be able to have an understanding of the history of our motherland and then to enhance their national identity. Uh, we also have um, a new program called a psychological counseling for our young rehabilitated offenders uh, called a change lab. So we will try to provide them with uh, positive thinking and enhance their law-abiding awareness, etc. Also, uh, we also have another program called What With Youth Program. It is uh, jointly organized by CSD and the volunteers of the police department. So there will be uh, teachers and other people from different walks of life so that they can understand that people surrounding them are actually caring about them. And it is important to abide by the law. And we notice that for some PICs, they are from secondary schools or they may be tertiary students. So we have been working with the Education Bureau on how to enhance them to bridge uh, into schools uh, after they have been released. Also, we have vocational training for such a young PICs. We have been trying to organize vocational programs uh, which are more in line with the current department. In the past, maybe we will be um, giving them uh, car rep repair workshop training, but now we will train them to be baristas and also maybe training them to become barbaras or also interior design. So we are trying to organize vocational training program in line with the latest uh, demand you know, of our society. So we would also try to provide job matching for them after they have been released. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Wong chun said, and then Mr. Ma Fong Kwok. Mr. Wong? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Secretary. I have three questions. Uh, the Secretary has talked about education for young people, especially on national security. And the six disciplinary services and the two auxiliary services have been trying to establish uniform groups for young people. Uh, but for activities which are not designated by the schools or related to the school curriculum, the parents or the students may not be willing to participate in them. Also, there are 14 youth groups in the community, and these youth groups are also have difficulty recruiting uh, their members. So I would like to know whether for the new uniform groups established by the uh, disciplinary forces or the auxiliary services, will you turn them into school-based activities? This is the first question. The second question has also been touched upon by the secretary. Um, you said that the police is helping to uh, facilitate work in the quarantine hotels. And I think some frontline officers have relayed to me that they have to have a test for negative result 48 hours before they go to work. So it is difficult for them to get such test results. And they have to queue up for two, three hours for the COVID test. And they have written to the Security Bureau to see whether um, these measures and uh, these people can be given priority for testing. Also, the last question 
has talked about the um, advanced uh, passenger information scheme, the API. Um, there is legislation, proposed legislation for this, but uh, people have been saying that uh, you will be trying to capture the personal information and stop them from leaving uh, Hong Kong. So I would like to know whether there are similar arrangements in other countries or territories so that you will try to uh, have advanced clearance of such information and whether you will have publicity and promotion for this uh, API system. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wong. Thank you, Chairman. On the first question, for the uh, uniform youth groups, we will be using the schools as the basis. And also, we will try to recruit uh, young people from joining them in the community. I think our uniform groups are different from the existing uh, youth groups in the community because we can share experience of law enforcement with them. For example, for the uh, civil aviation uh, forces, we will try to give them an experience of flying helicopters. For junior police call, uh, members, they can visit uh, our police facilities, and I think that uh, they may find it attractive. The second point about quarantine center, uh, we understand that the colleagues are responsible for guarding the quarantine center will have a special need and to spare them um, the time, the several hours of queuing up. We've agreed to set up a mobile testing station with the Center for Health Protection uh, in the vicinity of the uh, quarantine center to facilitate the testing uh, required of the discipline services staff. And we're in the process of of uh, tendering to set up uh, similar mobile testing stations in the uh, uh, auxiliary ambulance uh, post. Now, uh, uh, for the advanced passenger information system, we need to fulfill the international obligation under the Convention on International Civil Aviation, which is actually a requirement applicable to uh, all countries. So we implement this system to prevent uh, the entry of non-refoulement claimants. Next, Mr. Ma from Kwok. Mr. Ma, please wait. Mr. Ma, am I coming through? Well, we're in, in the midst of the coronavirus epidemic, and uh, we have a um, rather sizable population who are underemployed or unemployed, and some people, some job seekers are really anxious. There are scamming activities relating to. Um, job search and investment, and according to the police's information last year, investment scams rose by 196% or over 1,000 cases. For online job scams, it rose by over 350% or 827 cases. So my question is, what are the measures that will be put in place? so that you can join hands with, say, the Hong Kong MA and the uh, Labor and Welfare Bureau to tackle the scamming activities in order to lift um, prospective job seekers and the general public uh, out of the plight. Thank you, Chairman. The police is aware of these deception and scams especially targeting job seekers. Now, we have uh, made a lot of effort. We use social media platform, YouTube, Weibo, Facebook, uh, IG, etc. We mount publicity against these scams. We also have the Anti-Deception Coordination Center, the ADCC, uh, specializing in uh, combating such scams. And we also have this mascot called Little Grape to uh, remind members of the public not to become victims of the scam. The little grape is proven to be very uh, popular. And we also have TV 
uh, programs such as the SCOOP or uh, um, a current affairs program to help us publicize our message uh, and against uh, scams. And we also have uh, anti-deception drama series with six episodes with uh, a TV station. So as to remind everyone to be aware of uh, deception cases. Now, for young people, we attach great importance to publicity. Uh, as Mr. Ma mentioned at the moment, uh, it, may, it will be difficult to find a job. So we need to remind everybody to be vigilant. Mr. Lamson Kong and then Mr. Lai Tong Kwok, Deputy Chair. Thank you, Chair. Secretary. Well, I've come across many young and talented lawyers. They uh, have graduated from elite schools in Hong Kong. And after the black clad violence, um, they uh, remained um, affected by uh, the idea of achieving uh, justice through breaking the law. And I think that in a democratic society uh, based on the rule of law, it's everyone's duty to abide by the law. There should be some coordination among the uh, government uh, departments to enhance the sense of law-abiding awareness in our population. Otherwise, there will be smearing against the Hong Kong national security law, um, calling it uh, a tool to suppress freedom. So I urge the Security Bureau to join hands with other policy bureaus to draw up a long-term and sustainable plan in order to enhance the law-abiding awareness uh, of our young people. Thank you. I fully agree with Mr. Lamson Kern. We definitely need to enhance the law-abiding awareness of our young people and instill in their minds a sense of national security. Now, this is not only the Security Bureau's portfolio. Of course, we're the leading bureau, but we should also work with, say, the Education Bureau. Now, there are different initiatives as far as education is concerned. For example, national anthem and uh, flag raising in schools. These are initiatives to enhance the law-abiding awareness of young people. We also have seminars to uh, raise a law-abiding awareness, and the RTHK recently prepared a program with a focus on the, constitu the Constitution, Article 23, law abiding awareness to educate the general public the above said matters. I fully agree with Mr. Lam. But I hope that the, a joint plan will be drawn up instead of each bureau working on its own. I understand a lot of efforts uh, have been made. But I believe that we have many young people affected, close to a million, and this is a social issue. We need to make a joint effort. We should not give the task to a single bureau or a single secretary. There should be some joint effort. If I may, Chairman, I'd like to supplement. In fact, we have the Basic Law Promotion Steering Committee chaired by the Chief Secretary for Administration within the government. So there is coordination among government bureaus and departments on matters relating to, say, the promotion of the basic law, the constitution, and Hong Kong national security law. Next, uh, Deputy Chair, and then Ms. Elizabeth Kwat. Thank you, Chairman. Now, first of all, I'd like to thank the discipline services in Hong Kong for their support to the government's MP epidemic work. I understand from the Secretary that you have deployed additional 600 staff for contact tracing. In your original speaking notes, it's 400. In other words, just within the short period of time, you have um, substantially increased manpower for this purpose. Now, my question is, what is the coordination undertaken by the Bureau uh, as far as manpower deployment is concerned to give uh, full play to the manpower available? Second question, 
in light of the surge of uh, number of cases, those who test preliminary positive have to wait for a long time before uh, they could be sent to hospital. Now, one means of transport is, of course, the ambulance. I want to know whether there is, at the moment, a keen demand for uh, ambulance services. And what is the Bureau's plan to step up a service capacity? Third question. I understand that negotiations are underway to facilitate Hong Kong residents' travel to the Greater Bay Area and to allow um, the flow of talents uh, to travel to mainland cities, especially non-Chinese nationals residing in Hong Kong. May I know the details? Will they be able to get multiple entry visas to GBA cities? Secretary. Yes, first on coordination among discipline services. First of all, I am grateful to all the uh, heads of discipline services. We work on a united front, and after the black hat violence in 2019, uh, there have there has been a seamless uh, cooperation, and we all join hands uh, in uh, combating the riot. Well, say if there is a demand for several hundred uh, staff, then very swiftly we'll be able to um, garner that. Uh, the manpower needed from diff different discipline services. On the use of ambulances, we understand there is at the moment a keen demand and suitable manpower deployment has been put in place. Apart from the fire services department, the uh, auxiliary medical service will also deploy their ambulances to help transport infected persons. And we also have FSD colleagues deployed uh, to the contact tracing office to help um, dispatch ambulances as they are more experienced. Now, to respond to your third question about the flow of talent within the Greater Bay Area cities, uh, we are now discussing with the relevant mainland authorities. Our plan is to allow Hong Kong uh, to allow um, residents in the nine cities of Greater Bay Area to apply for a special visa or endorsement so that they could stay, uh, come and stay in Hong Kong for a longer period of time, and it's a facilitation measure. And we'd also like to facilitate non-Chinese nationals residing in Hong Kong to apply for a visa to travel to GBA cities. And um, this will be a visa of a longer term, say for three or five years, to facilitate uh, their business and other activities in the Greater Bay Area. However, um, there has been a delay because of the epidemic, but we will continue our effort in this regard. Ms. Elizabeth Quad, and then next Ms. Maggie Chen. Thank you, Chairman, Secretary. First of all, I'd like to thank the Security Bureau and the Discipline Services for safeguarding national security and supporting the government's work in combating the epidemic at the front line. I have three questions. First, well, there have been calls to complete legislation on Article 23 of the Basic Law within this term of government. Now, I still wonder whether it's possible to complete legislation on Article 23 within this term of government. There are still loopholes yet to be plugged. So, Secretary, um, is it possible to complete this task as soon as possible? Next, about CBD, I'm happy to learn that the Secretary has taken on my suggestion, and then there will be um, enactment of legislation as soon as possible to tackle the CBD products. You mentioned it will be done within this year. At the moment, we see the availability of CBD products in the local market. There are also shops dedicated to the sale of such products, um, such as a CBD coffee. So how do we ensure that the so-called CBD products will not contain um, THC? Third question about uh, youth groups. 
Now, I really appreciate your effort in enhancing the law-abiding awareness of young people and training their discipline. I find it very useful. For participating schools, they complain of um, lack of resources uh, as they like more students to participate in these groups. So they want to strive for more resources to make more places available, and I, I'm sure many more schools will be happy to join. So would there be more resources for youth groups? so that more schools and more students can participate. Secretary, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First one about legislation, Article 23 of the Basic Law. Uh, we are now trying to see what elements should be comprised under the legislation and what criminal acts should be included and how it should be enforced. So apart from looking at the experience uh, back in 2003 we have also been trying to look at the situation in hong kong for the past two years and also the relevant legislation in the mainland and overseas and then also the experience that we have gained after the implementation of the nsl so we'll be able to be aware of the challenges that we're going to face so this is not a simple matter it is a very complicated issue we have to ensure that the events in the past uh, will also be uh, taken into consideration. So we're hoping that uh, within by May this year, we'll be able to come back to the security panel and have a consultation. The second issue concerns the control of CBD products. On the um, enforcement of CBD, we also hope that we'll be able to put a legislative proposal in May. But before the implementation of new legislation, we are not sitting uh, still. We've been trying to enhance our enforcement action. Since 2019, we have conducted 110 um, enforcement actions, and we have prosecuted 21 cases. And also in recent months, we've been trying to enhance um, our enforcement action. If you are aware of the recent news, you will know that we've been trying to go to the chain stores and we've been trying to uh, look at the CBD products. And about 20% of the CBD products that we have tested, I think uh, most of them contain uh, THC, which is a dangerous drug. On the uh, youth uniform groups. Uh, of course, we hope to we can enhance our work in this aspect. Uh, we hope that they will be popular among the youngsters, and we are aware that the young people will be able to enhance their self-confidence and also uh, their law-abiding awareness. So under the uh, circumstances uh, or the resources that we have, we'll try to enhance work in this aspect. Uh, Honorable Maggie Chen. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Secretary and also all the disciplinary services for helping us to protect our, our homes and our property and our lives. Uh, Secretary, I note from paragraph 2 of the paper that you've been saying that the uh, national security law and the relevant legislation will be reinvigorated or reviving the existing legislation. So I would like to know how you're going to revive our existing legislation. Uh, for me, I think you have to amend the wording in the existing legislation. For example, under Article 3 to 10 of the uh, Crimes Ordinance and then also the Society's Ordinance and the Related Ordinances, there are still terminologies relating to the Queen and also the United Kingdom or the United Kingdom Territories. I know these wordings are archaic and have been changed to the central authorities after the handover. But I think it is not sufficient to enhance the awareness of the Hong Kong people as a whole, because unlike us, they are not lawyers. They will not look at the specific terminologies. So I would like to know, apart from the legislation for Article 23 of the Basic Law, will you be revising the terminologies of the other legislation, which are a bit uh, archaic? Uh, thank you. Uh, 
the Honourable Megan Ch Maggie Chen for your uh, comments. Uh, apart from revising on the revising of existing legislation, of course, we will try to uh, update the terminologies. Uh, the provisions that you have mentioned about, like the uh, official secrets uh, ordinance and the other crimes ordinance, they will also be covered under the legislative exercise concerning the legislation Article 23 of the Basic Law. So there may be changes in the relevant terminologies. Uh, you were referring to some terminologies which are back, dated back to the colonial times, and these would definitely be updated under the legislative amendment proposals. Well, our time is tight, but I would also like to point out that for the criminal ordinance, there is an offence, say, attacking the Queen. But I think under the existing legislation, this may be interpreted to mean by uh, turning down the existing government. So also there is another provision that I want you to take pay attention to about paragraph 4 of the paper. You are saying that you are going to look at the relevant court or, the, or verdicts concerning the national security law. So I would like to know whether you would take into account Article 6 of the NSL, uh, whether when you are doing the local legislation, would you be uh, making a positive list for people when they take offs? Well, I know that the relevant departments are studying the issue, and uh, on the issue of taking off, it has been uh, being taken care of by the relevant department. Uh, there are some terminologies which we have pointed out are already outdated. I think definitely we will take that into account when we go for the legislation in Article 23. Two more questions. Sorry, Maggie Chen, the, your time is up. And we need to invite our next colleague, Dr. Zhao Menkuang. And then uh, the Honorable Carmen Ken. Thank you, Chairman. I noticed that in the past two or three years, there has been a lot of pressure on the security uh, department. There was a radical violence in the 2090s, and now there is the pandemic issue. So I want to express my thanks to the uh, disciplinary services for their work. I think now the number of COVID cases has been increasing exponentially. And I noticed that the department police and the disciplinary service have been uh, helping out with the situation. And they are now working from 9 a.m. to 3 a.m., so some 10 hours working shift for them. So I would like to know whether the Security Bureau has any statistics on this. I've been looking at the figures for the civil service. Uh, we have about 170,000 uh, civil servants, and apart from the uh, uh, there are some colleagues from the GFS which can be uh, transferred out to help us. There are about some 60,000 colleagues. But how many sort of disciplinary service staff can be uh, redeployed to help with the anti-pandemic work? And also whether you would have any recruitment campaign for encouraging colleagues who have retired to come back and help us. I think there are several things that we have to work on. I think there will be a lot of large-scale LTDs and also testings uh, that need to be uh, conducted, and also large-scale vaccination. And I think we have to help the people who are uh, quarantine, having quarantine at home, and how can we support them. So this affects actually the security of our society as a whole. And I hope that, uh, Secretary, you can help us in these aspects. Secretary, uh, thank you, Dr. Ch uh, Dr. Chow. Every day, now we have about 1,000 to 2,000 colleagues who are helping out with the anti-pandemic work. For example, they would help out with the LTD exercises. Uh, we have about some 600 people who have been helping uh, to work uh, concerning the work of uh, the close contacts of COVID cases. And also, we've been helping with uh, people who are under home quarantine work. Uh, we have been redeploying some colleagues to help with the uh, health department. I think anti-pandemic work is the first priority of the government as a whole. If there is need for our colleagues to help out, we will definitely do our best to do so and try to help out as much as we can. This is something that we must do. Uh, the second issue concerning about the recruitment of retirees to come back to us. I think the police and the CSB has been doing a lot of such recruitment. Uh, recently, we have recruited some 
colleagues uh, who have retired to come back to help us, and they are in hun hundreds. And they will be help out with the RTD exercises and other anti-pandemic work. So under the circumstances of not affecting our daily operation, we will try to help out as much as we can. Uh, the Honorable Carmen Ken and then Mr. Tang Ka -byu. Thank you, Chairman. Well, first of all, I would like to represent all of us uh, colleagues who have spoken, spoken or not spoken uh, to thank the Security Bureau and the six disciplinary services and the two auxiliary services who have been helping us with uh, work concerning anti pandemic and enhancing national security in Hong Kong. I am also concerned about paragraph 5 and 6 of the paper concerning uh, strengthening cyber and data security. I think the legislation for enhancing such is in, as important as the legislation in Article 23 of the Basic Law. So I would like to know whether there is a timetable for the cybersecurity legislation. I noticed that you say that you are going to conduct a public consultation. Uh, I think it affects a lot of sectors like the financial sector, uh, telecom sector, etc. But uh, as a whole, I think I would like to know the timetable. And then also whether we have the relevant uh, manpower to help out. Also, when we talk about the cybersecurity legislation, I hope you would make reference to the relevant legislation in the mainland of China because it has been enacted effective since the 1st of September. So I hope you would make reference to that, the relevant legislation in the mainland. Uh, Secretary has also mentioned about the safe Greater Bay Area and also the enhancement of talent flow within the uh, GBA so that for the non-Chinese uh, residents in Hong Kong, they should be able to flow freely within the GBA so that they will enhance the economic competitiveness of the Greater Bay Area. I hope that you would also try to uh, enhance the uh, scrutiny of these people so that we will not affect the national security of our motherland. Secretary, uh, Mr. Chairman, on the legislation for uh, cyber security, our plan is to consult the security panel in the latter half of this year. Cyber security legislation is very important, and we are trying to target uh, the uh, cyber security crime. We were trying to target the uh, organizations and also the critical information uh, infrastructure, for example, like water supply, electricity supply, and then also the uh, financial institutions. Uh, from the overseas experience, uh, if these critical information infrastructure is being attacked, it will affect the community as a whole. So we would be trying to have uh, security prevention measures, a preventive management system for the CIIs, and although we will have um, contingency plans, we will have drills, and then we will also have uh, information exchange systems. So we'll be focusing on these areas. And uh, as uh, Mr. Carmen Khan said, we have also made reference to the relevant legislation in our motherland and in overseas countries. On the flow of people within the GBA, uh, we will not be doing a lot of uh, scrutiny, but of course we will try to process them as they have to apply for uh, the necessary visas. Mr. Tang Kavil, followed by Mr. Josie Chen. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my thanks to the secretary and all the disciplinary uh, services colleagues, you know, for helping us in this difficult time. And I think I would like to speak uh, their minds as well. My first question is for the incumbent disciplinary services, would they be able to be retired at the age of 65 like other civil servants. I think for the anti-epidemic work, we need a lot of the colleagues from the uh, disciplinary services to help out. I think they are working just like the staff of the housing department. So why can't they retire at 65? They are very important talents. 
Well, nowadays for Hong Kong, we are facing a lot of uh, different kinds of crime, and the criminals are getting smarter. And they may affect national security, and there will be impact on the legislation for Article 23 of the Basic Law. So why would we allow these people to leave the service before they are age 65? So would it be possible for them to all retire at the age of 65? I am also concerned about the legislation for Article 23 of the Basic Law. We emphasize a lot of work on investigation and uh, prosecution, but sometimes the court are uh, not able to process the cases in time. So I would like to know whether it will be possible for us to establish a special court so as to co conduct cases relating to national security law and process them so that they will not be mixed up with other criminal cases. Thank you, Chairman. In 2015, the civil service extended the retirement age across the board for, for discipline services from 55 to 60. And in light of um, other the operational need of uh, the respective discipline services, such as uh, recruitment need, we have different uh, measures to extend the retirement age for police, uh, for the police force. Colleagues who joined before year 2000 had an option to choose to retire at the age of 60. Now, as for whether we should further extend retirement age from 60 to 65, I think we should consider the manpower implications after the retirement age has been extended to 60 first and see whether there are difficulties for certain um, uh, job types. And we will conduct timely reviews to see whether we should implement another change. The other point, whether a special court should be set up, this is, uh, I'm afraid, not under the purview of the uh, Security Bureau. We have specially appointed uh, judges under the Hong Kong National Security Law with the relevant experience. So we have this mechanism of appointing special judges. So far, the mechanism has been uh, very effective and and smooth. Now that's the situation so far. Next, Mr. Chairman again, and then Mr. Chen Kim Po. Thank you, Chair. I thank Mr. Tang, Secretary, for your leadership in safeguarding national security and fighting the epidemic. Uh, in the current epidemic, uh, current epidemic, many discipline services staff are fighting uh, at the front line. Uh, I understand that other members have already expressed uh, gratitude. I'd like to repeat once again that uh, I am grateful for your work. Now we, you have a lot on your plate, and we're looking forward to legislation on Article 23 of the Basic Law. I just received a report from Secretary. And I'd like to comment on publicity and public education. Now, for the Occupy Central movement and the black hat violence, uh, these inc incidents expose the need for further education and publicity. We need to make sure no more uh, mudslinging will happen during the legislation uh, of Article 23. I hope that, Secretary, you will make sure that this is done properly because this will also help prevent a repeat of uh, what happened in 2019 when the amendment bill was made. Now, on education, I want to speak uh, about schools. Now, Chairman, you mentioned that the work relating to uh, educating students about national security should be referred to the uh, Education Bureau. But I think that uh, we should also raise the awareness of young people to enhance their understanding of Article 23. Now, this is under the purview of our panel. I hope that we can combine publicity and education on um, legislating on Article 23. Secretary, we're not underestimating the challenges. Um, facing us on legislating on Article 23. 
we understand that there are still um, some uh, anti-China forces who'd like to um, deal blow to our work, especially when it comes to Article 23. The target uh, is espionage just activities and uh, foreign forces, and of course we will be facing some opposition, uh, mudslinging, and uh, some elements may try to hinder our work. And so I agree with Ms. Chan that we should step up our effort through various channels, apart from the ordinary APIs on TVs and traditional media, we should also make better use of online platform to um, educate the young people, and we should also explain clearly to uh, foreign investors and businesses the impact it will have, the legislation will have on um, their business. And I'm sure that um, everything will be under the sun. The other priority is to educate young people uh, better in schools and this is the task we'll be taking up with Education Bureau so as to promote the Hong Kong National Security Law and legislation on Article 23 in school campuses. Next Mr. Chen Kin Po and then I'll be the last one to speak. Mr. Chen Kin Po, thank you Chairman. I have a question on paragraph 14 about non referment claims and the relevant arrangement as the paper mentioned that the legislative amendment took effect on the first of August twenty twenty one and since then we've been able to put a stop to um, the delaying tactics and since the first of August last year it's been some time, Secretary. My question is whether you have identified new loopholes or flaws and how we should enhance our work in this regard. Because as we all know, we spend a lot of resources in handling these um, claimants who are not genuine refugees. The other point is about uh, police recruitment. May I know whether there's been any improvement in terms of uh, remuneration and benefits. A great structure review was uh, undertaken earlier. I want to know from the Secretary whether there will be any uh, improvement. Thank you. On non refoulement claims, last year we enacted the Immigration Amendment Ordinance 2021 with arrival measures. For example, we enhanced the efficiency of um, vetting applications, we prevented uh, delay tactics, and we also uh, enhanced the terms of reference of the uh, board to vet applications so that we could tackle the problem as source and enhance the measures on detention of non refoulement claimants. In the past two year years, however, because of the epidemic, The progress of repatriating non reformant claimants had not been satis satisfactory. At the moment, some 14,000 such claimants are staying in Hong Kong, and there are 700 plus outstanding cases. There are over 2,000 uh, cases that have gone through the uh, appeal board, and some 8,000 claimants are filing uh, judicial reviews and appeals, and some uh, 1,000 uh, claimants are waiting to be repatriated. What about police recruitment? On police recruitment, comparing to the situation before the Black Cloud violence in 2018-2019. Indeed, uh, the number of uh, job applicants has dropped due to a number of reasons. For example, during the Black Cloud violence, many young people uh, found that the police uh, actually ha had a hard job um, and they would also be sub uh, victims of uh, doxing in 20. 
2020, we received some 11,000 applications comparing to, say, 2018, 2019, when we received 17,000. It represented a drop. However, we have other schemes. For example, we work with tertiary institutions. We um, present awards, and we also try to attract uh, young graduates uh, coming back from overseas. And we step up our briefing work before recruitment. We also have open days to enhance the attractiveness of the force to our young people so as to raise the uh, recruitment rate. Secretary, finally, I have a number of questions. First of all, I thank you and the discipline services for your effort in safeguarding national security and fighting the epidemic. I have two questions. Well, at the moment, the alert level for a terrorist attack in Hong Kong remains um, at medium. Uh, thanks to the work of the disciplined forces, However, it's uh, said that the mode of uh, terrorist attacks has, not, uh, has now turned underground, and as such, the police would step up intelligence gathering, and uh, there are also measures to educate the public, uh, such as encouraging them to report uh, suspicious uh, cases. However, in terms of uh, public education, I think the strategy remains um, some old, quite old-fashioned, such as the slogan, run, hide, and report. I want to know whether there are new measures to educate the public, first of all, to identify terrorists, and second, in the event of a terrorist attack, how should one um, deal with it? And the second point is this. In starting from 2018, I've been following up with you on the issue of CBD. Now, you mentioned recently the police and the Customs and Excise Department had mounted numerous operations uh, to confiscate CBD products in the market. Still, they are widely available. You mentioned that the legislative work will be completed within this year. But other than that, are there any measures to uh, make sure that these CBD products will not be widely available uh, for sale in the market and within reach by our young people? Now, in terms of education on um, terrorism, we focus on two areas. First, how it should, how um, an incident should be handled. Apart from the publicity uh, campaign uh, titled "Run." hide and report, we also step up anti-terrorism training. If possible, such drills will be uh, witnessed by the public uh, some, on invitation. Sometimes we invite members of the public to take part in the in the, in the the drill. Um, for example, they could be uh, victims um, besieged by terrorists so that they have a better understanding of our anti-terrorism work. Second, Apart from response in distress situations, we need to enhance people's awareness on terrorist activities. And this means publicity. For example, we tell members of the public how they should identify suspicious persons. As for example, you may you may notice strangers in your neighborhood. And we also have a national security hotline. Now, because terrorist activities would endanger national security, and we welcome members ring, uh, ringing the uh, national security hotline, 62717171. We need to make sure people understand that terrorists is not something fictional. It could happen in reality, and we encourage them to report such matters. Next on CBD. Legislation is underway, but before that, we will step up enforcement action. In the past few months, we 
took targeted action uh, against uh, CBD products. We raided shops, and we also took enforcement action against sellers. And we found that, it, in fact, 20% of the so-called CBD products contain THC. And after rounds of enforcement uh, operations, uh, it seems that these activities have died down, and we will continue to step up enforcement action to prevent um, uh, people from uh, getting their hands on CBD products. But well, that's the end of this item. I thank the Secretary and the Permanent Secretary uh, for attending the uh, meeting. Next briefing by the Commissioner of Independent Commission Against Corruption on the Chief Executive's 2021 Policy Address. In attendance, we have ICAC Commissioner Mr. Simon Pei and also the Heads and Directors of ICAC. So without further ado, I will invite Mr. Pei to deliver his opening remarks. And if you want to speak, members, please uh, in the, um, please press the button. Mr. Pei, I'll give some salient points on the work report of the ICAC this year. In 2021, the corruption situation in Hong Kong continued to be well under control. We received 2,264 corruption complaints, excluding election complaints, which is 18% more than that of last year. The increase was attributable to the rising number of complaints in the private sector as a result of gradually reviving economic activities amid the pandemic. Despite the rise in uh, rise of 18%, comparing to the number of complaints recorded in 2019, the number of complaints received this year uh, is still slightly below that level. The three sectors with most complaints recorded were building management, construction, finance, and insurance industry. After improving the electoral system in Hong Kong, the election committee sub sector ele election and legislative council election took place smoothly, respectively, on the 19th of September and 19th of December last year. As at the end of nineteen, uh, as at the end of twenty twenty one, we received eight and fifty two complaints in respect of the two elections, of which seven and forty eight complaints, respectively, are pursuable complaints. In respect of the electoral election twenty twenty one, apart from taking resolute action against offenders of the election corrupt and illegal conduct ordinance, we also adopted preventive and intervention strategy to combat acts which may constitute manipulation or damage to the election. In particular. A new offence has been created under Section 27, Capital A of the ECICO that is inciting another person not to vote or to cast invalid vote or by activity in public during election period. We also supervise the polling and counting procedures in these two elections. We're now analysing our observations. If necessary, we will make corruption prevention recommendations to the government. On the day of uh, the electoral general election, a total of 900 ICAC officers were deployed to handle public inquiries and complaints at over 600 polling stations, including three stations at the border control points. We also have additional staff to handle telephone inquiries and complaints at our report centers. The director of staff of ICAC also visited different polling stations to show support to our colleagues. The presiding officers and other staff welcomed the ICAC's presence at the polling stations. They believe ICAC officers could directly handle issues which might relate to the election corrupt and illegal conduct ordinance, which in turn reassured polling staff to focus on their duties in the polling stations. Hong Kong is a uh, highly corruption-free and has always won international recognition. At the end of last month, Transparency International published the Corruption Perceptions Index 2021, in which Hong Kong ranked 12th among 180 countries and places similar to last year. We're also one of the best performing places in Asia Pacific. In a World Competitiveness Yearbook 2021 published in June by IMD, the integrity ranking of Hong Kong rose by four places to the eighth, comparing to last year. Amid a political atmosphere full of tension, in which Western governments and the media attack the rule of law in Hong Kong with every excuse, 
the rise in the above rankings by internationally renowned organizations are hard to come by. It reflects the ICAC's achievements in international liaison and publicity. It is also proof to the robustness of our corruption prevention regime and the rule of law. Next, I will brief members on our work plan in the coming year. The ICAC has kick-started a two-year integrity promotion campaign for public bodies to promote to the senior management of public bodies organizational integrity and ICAC's corruption prevention education service to assist public bodies strengthen their integrity management system. We will continue to deploy resources in areas of public concern relating to public safety and the public coffers. Noting that a number of new railway projects are in the pipeline, the ICAC will assist the MTRCL to strengthen the corruption prevention measures in various stages of the projects, including um, the tendering process, and help organize regular integrity management training for MTRCL's project staff, consultants, and contractors to raise their corruption prevention capabilities and awareness. We'll continue to, co to collaborate with the SFC, the Financial Reporting Council, Hong Kong MA, and the Insurance Authority to keep our financial market clean and bolster our status as an international financial center. The ICAC has signed uh, memorandums of understandings with SFC and FRC, respectively. We'll also prepare a new online practical guide and other training courses for the banking sector to enhance the professional ethics of banking practitioners and the integrity culture of the industry. The ICAC is quickening its pace in rolling out the ethics promotion campaign for the insurance industry titled Integrity for Success. Last year, together with Construction Industry Council and Development Bureau, we jointly launched an industry-wide integrity charter and garnered the support of public works departments, housing departments, relevant public bodies, and construction trade associations. We'll continue to provide corruption prevention training services to participating companies and registered contractors. In light of corruption in the construction industry arising from taking bribes for job referrals, the ICAC has stepped up its publicity against bribery. Salient points of corruption laws can be found in posters, leaflets, and APIs in, a, in order to remind frontline workers not to tolerate corruption. As the property management sector is more prone to corruption, the ICAC will assist the Property Management Services Authority to enhance its internal control. We will assist licensed property management companies in implementing the Code of Conduct on Prevention of Corruption and the Related Best Practice Guide. We'll continue to closely monitor corruption risks arising from building renovation and maintenance subsidy scheme to prevent corruption and bid rigging in the process. Young people do not have a full awareness and understanding of corruption, and their law abiding awareness is weak. The ICAC organized an IPLUS training camp for IT leaders in December last year to foster a deep understanding for Hong Kong's anti graft work and cultivate the core values of law abidingness and integrity. This year, the ICAC will step up further moral and civic education for young people. Messages of the rule of law, law abidingness, honesty, reporting corruption, etc., will be incorporated into the regular programs tailored for young people of different development, uh, development stages. The ICAC will also launch an All for Integrity public engagement signature event, engaging members of the ICAC Club in planning and organizing activities to mark the 25th anniversary of the ICAC Club. A new API on the theme, Stand Firm Against Corruption, our mission continues, has just been launched. A new drama series, ICAC Investigators 2022, will also be launched to showcase the Commission's relentless anti graft determination to hammer home the anti corruption messages to the public. On election, the internal interdepartmental working group will draw on the experience of the EC subsector election and electrical election to formulate a comprehensive action plan with timely adjustments to our strategy with a view to safeguarding the integrity and fairness of um, public elections, including the upcoming chief executive election and the rural representatives election. We will keep close liaison with the 
Constitution and Mainland Affairs Bureau, the Electoral Affairs Commission, the REO and the police force in order to ensure a clean election. On international and mainland cooperation have been approved by the Central People's Government and the Hong Kong SCL government to run for and won the seat as chair of the International Association of Anti Corruption Authorities, IAACA, for three years. This signifies the global community's recognition of our anti graft work in Hong Kong. It also allows ICAC to play a crucial leading role of anti corruption on the international stage. As chair of the IAACA, I will lead and strengthen the collaboration among anti graft agencies in over 140 countries and places and enhance the association's participation in anti graft work worldwide so as to help achieve target 16.5 of sustainable development goals. That is, substantially reduce corruption and bribery in the in all their forms. Greater Bay Area development is one of the four regional development strategies proposed in the national 14 to five year plan, contributing to the country's economic development and opening up. After the promulgation of the Greater Bay Area Outline Development Plan in February 2019, the ICAC has been actively liaising with the anti graft agencies in the mainland and the Macau to exchange views on promoting integrity culture and combating corruption in the Greater Bay Area. Despite the pandemic, the ICAC has been working closely with the National Commission of Supervision, the Guangdong Provincial Commission of Supervision, and the Commission Against corruption of Macau. We're organizing the second tripartite meeting to map out the strategy for enhancing anti-corruption collaboration in the region. As a pilot in the Greater Bay Area, the ICAC is actively discussing with the Tianhai Anti-Corruption Bureau to jointly offer corruption prevention consultancy services to Hong Kong enterprises with operations in Tianhai. The ICAC and the Tianhai Anti-Corruption Bureau conducted jointly a questionnaire survey in 2021 to gauge the need of Hong Kong enterprises for such corruption prevention services. In light of the plan for comprehensive deepening reform and opening up of the Tianhai Shenzhen Hong Kong Modern Service Industry Cooperation Zone, or Tianhai Plan in short, promulgated in September 2021, we're now actively discussing the hosting of an anti-corruption seminar for the above enterprises. The ICAC will hold online meetings with the Bureau to formulate a cooperation plan for early implementation once quarantine-free travels to the mainland are resumed. The ICAC will continue to enhance anti-graft cooperation and experience sharing with international and mainland counterparts. We will demonstrate to the world that Hong Kong is corruption-free and abides by the rule of law, and will continue to organize online training courses for overseas anti-graft agencies before travel restrictions are lifted. Chairman members, in the past year, Hong Kong national security law and improvement to the electoral system have allowed Hong Kong to enter a new era of prosperity after order has been restored from chaos. As the anti-corruption agency in Hong Kong, the ICAC will remain steadfast in fulfilling its anti-corruption mission and work with Hong Kong people. We will help maintain the rule of law and the level playing field for businesses in Hong Kong and bolster Hong Kong status as an international financial shipping, logistics and trade center. Through international cooperation, we will continue to promote to the world Hong Kong's advantages as a clean, honest regime and the rule of law. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I have three colleagues who would like to speak. Uh, Mr. Wang Junshai, Mr. Tan Ka Piu, and then Mr. Chen Chen Ying. Three minutes, question and answers, please. Mr. Wong. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. I have a question concerning the accountants. Uh, the accountants have been uh, working closely with the ICAC, and there is um, a center under the ICAC which had been helping our sector to prepare anti-corruption uh, materials and also to enhance our integrity management. Last year, I know that um, there is a joint operation with the uh, Financial Reporting Council to tackle the, uh, uh, the abuses by the relevant companies. So I would like to raise a question. For the last year, 
Uh, what are the figures concerning the private sector and how many of these cases concerns the accounting sector? And also the um, FRC will be uh, sort of uh, overlooking our sector. So I would like to know how can we collaborate with them to increase our integrity management. Thank you, Commissioner. As for the accounting sector, I would like to ask my colleague, Mr. Yao, head of our operations, to provide the information. And as regards the uh, cooperation with the um, FRC, as we have already signed a memorandum of understanding, and we would like to enhance our collaboration. So I would like to ask uh, Mr. Yao to speak up. He's in a different room as to, uh, to the cases that we have received. Uh, Mr. Yao Shichun. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Wong, for the question. For the uh, figures for the private sector, we have not sort of categorized them according to the sector. It's because accountants can be involved in various uh, commercial activities. So, um, for example, in the financial sector, last year for the cases that we have received is 98. Uh, but then all of them are related to the accounting sector or the accountants. Uh, as far as my memory serves me, I think the figures concerning accountants are very small in number. Uh, last year, we have a joint operation with the uh, FRC, and not many of the cases concern the accountants. Maybe afterwards, after the meeting, I can provide the number of complaints concerning the accountants. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, next, Mr. Chen Zhenying. Mr. Chen Zhenying. Uh, I'm here, Chairman. Mr. Chen, thank you, Chairman. Uh, first of all, I would like to make a declaration because I am uh, serving on one of the committees under the ICAC. And for the um, complaints relating to the elections, I think it is higher, uh, smaller in number as to the last election in 2016, uh, discounting the complaints concerning election expenses. Uh, I would like to know whether this is related to the number of colleagues that the ICAC has been deployed uh, to help out with the elections on the polling day. Uh, if yes, I hope the ICAC would continue uh, such efforts. My question concerns the private sector. Uh, there are a lot of contractors and material supplies uh, companies, and there are a lot of cases concerning them. I think we have already established uh, an integrity in management system. So I would like to know whether you have any information as regards the effectiveness of this system. And the number of cases, uh, has it been decreased as compared to the past? And also, the integrity management system uh, provides training as well, uh, because every year they can try to continue training. But for the construction workers, it's a bit different, because they work for different companies and different uh, construction sites. So do you have any training for the construction workers so that we can increase their integrity management? Commissioner. Well, for the uh, election that we have received is uh, the complaints that we have received concerning the election is less than the past. I think one of the reason is that because we have improved our election system, and then the situation is a bit different as compared to the past. As regards the uh, construction industry, uh, as I have said, we have introduced a system not for a long time, so I think we would need to look at the effectiveness uh, after it has been implemented for some time. So because of the shortness of time uh, following the introduction of the system, so maybe we don't have too much information on this. But I would like to ask uh, the colleague uh, from Ms. Uh, Mr. Lee, the Director of Corruption Prevention, to see if he has anything to supplement. Uh, thank you. On the integrity management system, it is introduced uh, in March, and the Development Bureau 
has asked all the contractors and the uh, material supplies contractors who are working on government projects, they have to fulfill two requirements. First, they got to have an integrity policy, and also they have to introduce uh, integrity training. Also, we have been working with the construction uh, CIC, Industry Council, and we try to promote this system to all the uh, companies in the construction sector. As the Commissioner has said, the system has been rolled out only for a short time. And uh, as regards whether there has been a number of cases that has been increasing, it is difficult to judge at this stage. And uh, it is difficult to see the relevance before, between the rollout of the integrity management system and the number of cases. So our plan is to continue to work with the Development Bureau, the CIC, and the industry, and try to require the companies for ex to ask their management staff to undergo integrity management training. And we will provide support for them. And we will try to organize uh, seminars and talks for the uh, management staff so that after training them, we hope that when they go back to their respective companies, they will try to establish their own system and try to uh, train uh, their staff. So we're going to do train their trainers. Mr. Tan Ka Piu, and then the last one is Mr. Chan Kin Bo, and then we'll complete discussion on this item. Mr. Tang, thank you, Chairman. I would like to also thank the Commissioner for his uh, introduction. I have a question on one aspect about the uh, building management companies. As we are aware, for the private sector, the ICAC has been paying a lot of attention to the uh, cases concerning building management. But uh, these cases involve the interests of a lot of uh, residents in the buildings. And they may go to the political parties or different government departments for help. So it has been a lot of talk within the community. And some of the cases may become an issue or politicized within uh, the particular district. So I would like to know, Commissioner, can you share with us whether there is any high-level measures that you can do, for example, like new legislation or your investigation or operations? Is there any way to have a breakthrough so that these issues will not proliferate? Because the buildings in Hong Kong are getting old, so there will be a lot of owners who will be facing issues concerning building management and maintenance. And also, there will be issues concerning tender rigging. Commissioner, thank you, Chairman. Uh, on the aspect of building management, we have been working on it for a few years. We have been having positive uh, intervention, and the number of complaints received have been decreased. Although the number of cases for the private sector has been increased, Increasing and building management remain the top of the list of the uh, complaints uh, concerning the private sector. In the past few years, we have been conducting a lot of uh, effective work. Uh, if we look at the figures, we can see there is a decrease in the number of complaints in the past years. But then, of course, we would also be looking at whether there will be corruption issues within building management and whether there will be tender rigging issues. Of course, building management covers a lot of other aspects, but we will need to work with the Home Affairs Bureau and the relevant bureaus and departments to work together to address the issue. Uh, also, I would like to invite my colleague, Mr. Yao, to talk about the measures undertaken by the Operations Department. Mr. Yao. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Tang, for your question. Building management is a very complicated issue because there are a lot of uh, stakeholders. Apart from the residents, there will be the management companies involved, and then also there will be contractors involved, political parties, community leaders. So a lot of people are involved. Well, this is not a new issue. It has been a matter that we've been focusing on for some years. 
uh, we know that every year our buildings are getting older and the building management issues will not be resolved within a quick time. So for the operations department, we pay a lot of attention to that. Although the number of cases top the list of complaints uh, in the private sector, but when we conduct investigation, we know that some of the issues concerning the building maintenance and management, and they arise because of some misunderstanding, and also because they have not been following the procedures uh, precisely. So there are suspected corruption cases. But then, of course, there are particular cases involving two conflicting parties, and they may have different views, and there may be a chance for corruption. So we are aware of the situation. So once we receive the campaign, we try to tackle it as soon as possible. And first of all, we will try to see if there is really a corruption case. Even if there is no corruption case, we hope that we will try to help them resolve the issue. If um, the matter concerns other departments or bureaus, we will relay the case to them. If there are a, really a corruption case or there is a tender rigging, then we will try to take stringent enforcement action. So apart from looking at the statistics, we can see that for the past few years, there have been people who have been trying to use building management uh, as a vehicle for gaining publicity, but this has been on the decrease. So we will try to adopt a two-pronged approach, like we will try to intervene, and then we would also try to take uh, stringent enforcement action if there is really a criminal case. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Last member to speak, Mr. Chen Kim Po. Thank you, Chairman. First of all, I need to congratulate. Uh, I need to congratulate Commissioner for uh, being uh, elected as chair of the IAACA. It shows the uh, international recognition of anti graft work in Hong Kong. Now, Commissioner, I understand that you have been liaising with uh, the uh, global anti corruption agencies, and may I? Seek your enlightenment on uh, the trend of uh, company corruption around the world. Second question You have different investigation teams uh, in the ICAC, and if systemic uh, loopholes are identified, uh, will a holistic approach be taken to plug these loopholes? Thank you, Chairman. In terms of the trend, anti-graft agencies around the world all seek to stem out corruption in their respective countries. I refer to the Transparency International's um, survey, which shows the different situations in different countries. They believe the anti graft work in many countries is not yet up to standard. So, an important task of the IACA is for the association to help anti graft agencies around the world to enhance their anti corruption capabilities. We've started our work in this regard. As for systemic corruption, Within ICAC, of course, there is very good coordination. The operations department, especially the directorate staff of the operations division, would have oversight of colleagues in different divisions in terms of the complaints received and the cases under investigation. And if systemic problems are identified, we'll definitely uh, strive to tackle them. Now, if, as far as the international scene is concerned, we continue to communicate and liaise with our counterparts around the world on corruption cases. Uh, this is done through the uh, liaison mechanism uh, on a regular basis, as well as exchange of uh, intelligence. 
and mutual assistance. This is an ongoing effort and it has been effective. So much for this item. I thank the Commissioner and the other representatives of ICAC. The next item is a crime situation in 2021. I will first invite the Commissioner of Police to walk us through the paper and then the floor will be open for questions. Please raise your hand if you want to speak. So I'll see if the uh, Police Commissioner is ready. Members, I think that members will be keen to ask questions under this item. So I propose to extend the meeting by half an hour. If necessary, we can further extend this meeting. Now, if you want to speak, please press the button now. I see Mr. Raymond Shiu, Commissioner of Police, and his colleagues, Mr. Chow Yat Ming and Mr. Tammy Chan. Uh, uh, Ms. Tammy Chan are here. So over to you, Police Commissioner. Thank you, Chairman Members. I'd like to report on Hong Kong's law and order situation in 2021, and then I will explain the national security situation and take members' questions. In 2021, overall speaking, we recorded 64,428 crimes, a slight increase of about 1.9% comparing to 2020. For violent crimes, 196 more cases were recorded. Overall speaking, the detection rate was 38.5%. Uh, now, for deception cases, we recorded an addition of 3,396 cases. For cases recording a drop, they include criminal damage, burglary, wounding and serious assault, arson, uh, robbery, etc. For wounding and serious assault, snatching, robbery, pickpocketing, gross misconduct in public places, and uh, assault, these were crimes which recorded a record low in the past 10 years. On robbery and burglary, with so, uh, with people's lives returned to normal, the police could focus resources on the combating such crimes. In terms of uh, detecting and tackling burglary cases, we have now have more focused resources. We have, uh, and people are more vigilant. The number of robbery cases recorded was 123 last year, a significant drop of 141 cases of 53.4%. There was no bank robbery and no robbery case involving the use of firearms in the six consecutive years. The detection rate was 78%. For burglary cases, there was a drop of 30%, down by 623 cases. 402 people were arrested with a detection rate of 35%. For robbery and burglary cases, we managed to uh, record a record low since 1969 with the highest uh, de detection rate in the past four decades. There were 23 murder cases up by one case comparing to 2020. 14 involved um, violence uh, within the family uh, or with relatives. All cases were detect detected. For sex crimes, for rape, there were 79 cases, an increase of 15 cases with a detection rate of 98.7%. Only one case involved a stranger. Uh, the case was detected. Over 40% of cases involved victims below the age of 16. For indecent assault, we recorded a rise of 50% uh, at a total of 1,018 IA cases. Now, uh, this is due to a record low uh, in the past decade due to the um, pandemic. Over 30% of victims were below the age of 16. For victims, 40 victims met their uh, culprits online. As So our focus is on protection for the underage and raising people's awareness. Apart from meeting 
stakeholders and parents on a regular basis. We also prepared two APIs on protecting children against sex abuse and online scams, and the APIs are distributed via parent-teacher associations. We remind parents to use the filter function and uh, help improve their children's media literacy online, and we'll continue to take this targeted approach. Next, I'd like to turn to deception. We notice a substantial increase in the number of deception cases. 19,249 cases of deception were recorded, a rise of 3,696 cases comparing to past year, over 70% related to online scams. It went up by 7,000 uh, cases comparing to um, the uh, uh, the, comparing to two years ago, that is, uh, the cases have gone up by 10,000 so far. Most of these increases uh, had to do with compensated dating scams, romance scams, investment fraud, and for online employment fraud and telephone deception, we recorded a drop of about 30%. We noticed that for telephone deception cases, victims were getting younger. 48.2% of cases detected last year had younger victims in the younger age bracket, and over 40% of these victims had uh, tertiary or above professional qualifications. Last year, the police mounted intelligence-led joint operations with different uh, counterparts around the world to neutralize different scam syndicates and successfully cracked down on 260 deception and online fraud cases, and we um, froze the proceeds of up to $15 million. We'll continue to work with uh, different sectors to raise the awareness of um, bank uh, bank uh, practitioners the banking sector. Now, the ADCC Anti-Deception Coordination Tele Center operates a hotline 18222, and we're able to intercept over 2.3 billion of payments in 833 cases. For blackmail cases, we recorded 1,592, an increase of 193 cases. Majority of cases, that is 73%, were related to naked chat and of notice is that uh, students accounted for 34.9% uh, in victims of naked chat cases. Uh, this is due to the prevalence of uh, friend-making um, apps, and uh, there is a trend for young people to send uh, picture, naked pictures, and due to the ignorance, they are vulnerable to becoming victims of naked chat scam, uh, blackmail cases. We continue to mount publicity, and junior police call last uh, in October last year organized a video competition uh, program to raise the awareness of young people. For child abuse, 1,232 child abuse cases were recorded, up by 60%. Most of these cases had to do with physical abuse. In October last year, we also started a scheme that is a large-scale educational publicity program um, targeting the protection of children. Through healthy parent-child activities, we appeal to the public to be mindful of uh, children's welfare and to raise the awareness, and also to educate children to protect themselves. In December last year, we received a complaint from the public and revealed a spate of cases relating to staff of uh, residential care home for children, uh, beating up children. Um, over 23 uh, perpetrators have been prosecuted. We will continue to pursue investigation. About serious narcotics, the, the figure recorded uh, showed a 30% increase. In terms of number of uh, drug takers, uh, drug abuses, the drugs manufactured, uh, they all showed an increase around the world. And due to the immigration control measures uh, tightening up, the trafficking syndicates have been shifting their uh, mode of uh, trafficking. 
They've shifted to smuggling mega quantities of drugs through sea in air freights. We step up efforts in combating drug offences, resulting in a record-breaking seizure of cocaine and ketamine. And apart from that, we also, overall speaking, seized a lot more drugs. Uh, the increase was from twofold to sixfold. On youth or juvenile crimes, in 2021, 3,021 youths were recorded, were arrested for committing criminal offences, down by 966 persons comparing to the previous year. But 112 person, more tw young persons were arrested uh, due to serious drug offences. It shows an overall uh, increase in number of juveniles and young persons arrested. And it also shows um, the trend of uh, using young persons in uh, drug trafficking offences. The police also um, mount operations to tackle syndicates using young people to move drugs. At the same time, we set up publicity and uh, public education. We educate parents. Uh, so and the social services sector and other stakeholders and appeal to them to join hands with the police to prevent young people uh, from being used as drug use and they we should make sure young people um, have no access to drugs and we've also um, kick-started a one-year program with uh, stakeholders on um, a leadership program and teach uh, young people to say no to drugs for Hong Kong national security law it's been implemented for more than uh, one and a half years and so far 160 people were arrested over 100 have been prosecuted the police will continue to gather intelligence and take resolute enforcement action that concludes my report chairman I'll be happy to take questions from members thank you commissioner Eight members have indicated the wish to speak, and let me remind members that if you want to speak, please press the button as soon as possible, or else I'll need to draw a line. Let me read out the list. Ms. B Mr. Bill Tang, Mr. Lai Tong Kwok, Ms. Elizabeth Kwok, Mr. Wong Chun Sek, Mr. Lim Sun Kung, Ms. Maggie Chen, Ms. Carmen Ken, and Ms. Chen Ring Yan, and myself. Anyone else? If not, I'll draw a line here. I'll be the last to speak. All right, we start with Mr. Bill Tang and then Mr. Lai Tong Kwok, Deputy Chair. Mr. Bill Tang. How many minutes each? Three minutes. Questions and answers included. Thank you, Police Commissioner, for the report. In terms of the overall crime figures, I see that the, we, the situation uh, is now stable thanks to the efforts of the police. But apparently... Domestic circumstances um, have become the hotbed for crime. Um, 14 out of 23 murder cases related to uh, domestic circumstances. We also have serious uh, assault and wounding and child abuse cases relating to um, to uh, domestic violence. And uh, we are all disheartened by what happened recently in Children's Residential Home, CRH. I understand that uh, the this, the uh, police would need to go through thousands of hours of CCTV footages. May I know the progress? And for DV-related crimes, it's a very clear trend uh, that uh, we, especially in terms of cases relating to child abuse. Now, how will the police work with other um, departments and units such as NGOs? The NGOs receive government funding to provide family services. I want to know whether there are any difficulty uh, in uh, working with the NGOs. Police Commissioner, thank you, Mr. Bill Tang. Let me first um, respond to the question on investigation of the children's residential home cases. As we explained before, there are over 60,000 hours of CCTV footages. We've completed about 70% or three quarters uh, of um, our work in this regard. And we believe 
within this month or by the end of this month, we'll be able to uh, have viewed all of the CCTV footages. For domestic violence crimes, indeed, uh, this is an upward trend. Last year, because of the epidemic and other uh, reasons such as the economy, many me people stayed longer at home, leading to, say, more dispute, disputes and constant and repeated uh, disputes at home. Over the years, in tackling the viol domestic violence crimes, on every occasion, we would deploy a sergeant to handle the case at scene. We also have an action list. This is to make sure that um, our officers could handle the matter in a professional manner. And apart from that, we also meet with the social welfare department on a regular basis on domestic violence cases and child abuse cases. We have a regular um, liaison mechanism. And after the children's residential home incident, we will step up cooperation and uh, hold more meetings with the department. Especially liaison with social workers and some NGOs. So we do have a regular cooperation mechanism with them. Deputy Chair TK Lai and then uh, Ms. Elizabeth Court. Deputy Chair, thank you, Chairman. I have a question concerning deception cases. I think the situation is getting worse. There are four categories of deception, like compensated dating scams and then also investment fraud. They have been increasing quickly. I would like to know whether the police force has considered introducing targeted publicity concerning such uh, cases. For example, about investment fraud, we noticed from the TV there are a lot of uh, financial investment programs. Uh, have the police considered liaising with the TV station so that you can give out messages uh, for prevention of deception cases in these financial programs? For example, when you uh, get a loan, you have to repay it. So these are important messages. You can include them in the advertisements for the banks. Secondly, about telephone deception cases. How can we differentiate such uh, deception cases? Uh, in the past, we can tell it from the telephone number because there is a plus sign before the number. But after a while, we have forgotten about useful tips like that. And I noticed that the telephone deception cases has decreased slightly, but it is still a very high figure. So can we get hold of the telecom companies to help because they can differentiate um, the phone numbers which are generated by computers. Is it possible to give us some uh, signal or messages so that we can tell them easily? I think after a while we have forgotten that the plus sign is uh, one of the uh, indication. And you notice that the number of uh, victims have been decreasing, the age of the victims are decreasing to people of the 20s. So would you make use of the social media to enhance uh, publicity against uh, deception cases? Commissioner, uh, thank you, Deputy Chair. We've been trying to adopt strategies uh, to enhance publicity against uh, deception cases. For the past two years, we have been making use of the social media and also the conventional media and various channels to have a comprehensive uh, publicity against deception cases. Mr. Lai has talked about whether we can work with the TV stations and also radio stations. So we have been trying to do so, and we make use of their popular programs uh, to help disseminate messages against uh, deception cases. 
for the coming year, we will try to continue to do so, and we will try to have intensive publicity against uh, deception cases. Well, allow me to give a little bit of publicity. We have actually going to uh, conduct another publicity month uh, on uh, anti-deception cases, and we have seven uh, main strategies. And the issues that you mentioned have already been included. For example, we will try to use uh, government APIs, and I think some of you may have seen them already. Also, we will try to target the young people. We will try to use the online platforms um, to disseminate messages against uh, deception cases. Also, we will try to make use of um, big uh, publicity boards uh, in the community. Also, we will try to make use of the TV stations programs to talk about deception cases. Uh, for us, we think that it is most effective to disseminate the messages repeatedly through the TV uh, programs. And we have been liaising with the uh, media, and we are working hardly on that. In addition, apart from the social media, we have also been liaising with the press, um, the magazine publications, uh, to enhance our publicity. Mr. Lai asked whether we would collaborate with telecom uh, companies as to whether we can give some signal like plus 852 so that they can tell that it is a deception telephone number. So we will follow up with the telecom companies on that. Thank you. Ms. Elizabeth Kuo, and then Mr. Wong chun -Sai. Thank you, Chair. First of all, I would like to thank the Commissioner and the force for protecting Hong Kong. I noticed from your report that the number of child abuse cases has been increased to 1,200-something. It has increased by about 60 percent. I think this is a very alarming figure. Also, the sexual offenses concerning child has increased by 55 percent. This is also very, very alarming, and I'm worried about that. People of are uh, all concerned about the children's residential home case, you have to wait until someone who comes forward to report the case before we become aware of it, because young children are not able to express themselves. So I would like to thank the police for watching the 60,000 hours uh, video recording and try to um, fight for justice for these children who have been abused. Well, since child abuse is such a serious situation. So the police has used mass costs like Little Grape to promote uh, against deception cases. So child abuse is getting very serious. So will the police try to enhance publicity in this regard and public education in this regard? Especially, we should encourage um, our citizens to try to detect child abuse cases and report them to the police so that we can decrease the number of children being abused. Well, the children's residential home case has also given us a message that even the NGOs working on child protection is trying to abuse uh, children and maybe beat them up a bit. And also for parents, they are now stuck at home with their children, and the emotions may be affected. And then they may have corporal punishment for their young children. So is there anything we can do to enhance publicity and public education so that all our citizens would understand that we should not abuse our children? Uh, in decent assault, these cases are also increasing. It has last time, uh, last year we have uh, passed a legislation concerning voyeurism. So is there any new development on this? Commissioner? Well, on the prevention and uh, child abuse cases and public education relating to that, I agree that it is very important. As I have said, since last October, we have been to November, we have been organizing a one month uh, publicity program to protect uh, children and raise awareness of uh, not to abuse our children. And through this uh, one-month large-scale campaign, 
we have been trying to raise the awareness not just of the child carers, but also for children themselves. They would understand that if they are being abused or beaten up, what they should do. We have a one-stop uh, app, which is being uh, can be used by the public for reporting uh, child abuse cases. So we will continue work in this regard. And also this year, we will try to have a series of uh, thematic uh, activities, uh, including, uh, well, as I said, about uh, deception. And then also, we will include child abuse as one of the themes. And we will try to use large scale activities to try to raise our citizens' awareness against the child abuse. This is a very important work. We are also grateful to the citizens who have been coming forward to tell us about the case of the residential, uh, children's residential home. On indecent assault, following the um, implementation of the new legislation last October, from October to end December, we have 134 cases concerning ways. Wayism. And we have arrested 96 uh, people. So this has been useful for us for tackling indecent assault cases. Uh, I would like to ask colleagues to be precise in raising your questions, because we still have six colleagues who would like to raise questions, and time is running out. Uh, Mr. Wong Chun Se and then Mr. Lam Shen Kang. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. I would like to thank the police for helping to stabilize uh, Hong Kong. I think the citizens are worried about the uh, sacrifice of the police officers when they enforce uh, actions. Uh, we are a lot there are a lot of uh, cases concerning uh, illegal illegal. Uh, So I would like to know whether there are any measures to concern at tackling the illegal smuggling of goods, and whether there are any measures to protect our officers in the front at the front line. Well, thank you, Mr. Wong. We have been paying attention to this and working together with the Customs Department on the smuggling of. Uh, illegal goods, uh, because of the closure of the land boundary control points, it is obvious that people have been trying to smuggle goods uh, through other channels. In the last year, we have been trying to step up work against that. We have arrested over 500 people, and we have seizure of uh, speedboats for smuggling uh, goods. We noticed that these syndicates have been using a lot of resources uh, to smuggle frozen food. And we have seized about 2,000 tons of frozen meat. And for these operations, we will try to continue them in the coming year. Uh, as to how to protect our officers in the front line, we have been trying to enhance the equipment, and then we also try to enhance our operation plans. And we will conduct regular review as regards to strategies that we are going to adopt. And we will also be liaising with the mainland relevant authorities and the mainland uh, security bureaus so that we will work out the strategies uh, in consultation with them. And we have continued liaison with them. And sometimes the operations may be joint operations involving uh, mainland relevant authorities. And for the equipment, we will try to review uh, the equipment that is being used by our frontline officers as to how to better protect them during operations. We have already identified a different equipment 
which can be used by our police officers, especially when they conduct operations at sea. Thank you. Mr. Lam Sun Kang and then uh, Ms. Chen Ai Ti. Thank you, Chairman. Apart from uh, the deputy chair's concern about deception cases, I am also worried about the situation. For the past two to three years, the number of deception cases have been increasing. And it's telling us that the strategies adopted by the police is not that effective. Uh, the commissioner has mentioned that there are different ways to try to decrease the number of deception cases. I hope they will be effective, and I hope that for the coming year, there will be a decrease in such cases. I would like to share with you that I have been coming across a lot of uh, commercial reception, deception cases. Uh, for example, the lawyers have been asked to try to uh, assist in the cases, and it may be involving local and overseas clients. I think this affects our image as an international business center, and I hope the police will work harder on this so that we can decrease the number of deception cases. Thank you. Commissioner. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Lamb. I mentioned at the outset that in the past two years, the number of deception cases rose by over 10,000 cases, and this is an issue close to our heart. Now, I like to explain that in the past two years, like I explained, we took an all-out approach through different channels in order to disseminate uh, anti-deception messages to the public. We even included anti-deception leaflets in the uh, water bill sent to domestic households with a view to hammer home the message. Now, of course, people are aware that uh, they should avoid um, being scammed. And we spoke to victims before. These victims had heard of these anti-scamming messages. But once they received um, the uh, calls from scammers, uh, they, at first they would not uh, believe them to be scammers. And they would not believe that uh, it was indeed a phone scam. So our approach is to explain the modus operandi of the perpetrators to the public. And I'd like to appeal to everyone here that as far as anti-deception messages are concerned, you need to remind uh, the uh, remind people around you of the modus operandi of these cases to raise their awareness. And apart from adopting different channels to disseminate the message, we would also engage the police clinical psychologists to speak to the victims of these cases to see how we can disseminate anti-deception messages more effectively. However, I do believe that Apart from the police, we should all make a joint effort. If you are aware of um, the modus operandi of a deception case, uh, do tell people around you. Next, Mr. Ms. Maggie, Ms. Maggie Chen. Thank you, Chairman. I have a question for the police commissioner. Many members have spoken on it on it before about the rape, indecent assault, domestic violence, and child abuse. You have recorded an increase in these cases. Now, I'd like to talk about women. For those underaged in rape cases, the number of cases increased by 72.2%. Now, Commissioner, in terms of protecting women, can you tell me whether you have a plan and whether you're going to step up your effort? The commissioner just now also explained 
um, domestic violence crimes and child abuse cases, and that the police would work with social workers and NGOs. Now, have you considered that apart from stakeholders um, such as NGOs, uh, you will also work with other grassroots organizations and women's associations? Commissioner. Yes, altogether 79 cases of rape was recorded, up by 15 cases or comparing to the previous year. According to our analysis, uh, uh, we looked at the relationship between the perpetrator and the victim. And in most cases, the rapist and the victim knew each other. Uh, they could be. Um, you know, a, a boyfriend, a former boyfriend, uh, ex-husband, or friend. In fact, among the 79 cases recorded last year, only one case was committed by a stranger. And like I said, we'll step up a law and order, uh, for example, uh, by uh, enhancing patrol in uh, at black spots. But I agree with Ms. Chen that perhaps we should work with NGOs and women's associations. This is absolutely necessary and where what we should be working on. Apart from women's groups and NGOs, I think one important stakeholder is schools. In the cases of rape or indecent assault, we have noticed that Apparently, more students, young girls in schools, were either raped or molested, especially in cases of rape. In 2020, there were 18 cases involving underage girls, but in 2020, uh, 2021, the number of victims increased to 31. Now, we've prepared different APIs. We hope that through NGOs and schools, these um, video clips can be played to students to enhance their awareness. Ms. Carmen Khan and Ms. Chen again. Thank you, Chairman. Now, I'm not going to repeat the points raised by other members. Now, I have a specific question for the police commissioner. The electrical members and members of the public understand that the, the government plans to table a bill into electrical on mandatory reporting of child abuse cases. Now, apart from child abuse, you mentioned in the report cases involving domestic violence and elderly abuse. May I know the legislative progress, whether you propose to set up a mandatory reporting mechanism? If not, uh, are there any plans? And are there preventive measures taking into account, for example, that it takes a long time to prosecute a case? Will you consider setting up a database for uh, people involving in misconduct cases? Now, on deception, um, Deputy Chair Mr. Lai mentioned the point. Apart from using traditional media, would you consider? Enlisting the help of community organizations, district offices, etc., to mount prevent uh, preventive education. Because, like Commissioner, you said it is very important. We consider engaging community organizations. Thank you, Ms. Ken, for your questions. First, on domestic violence cases, including child abuse and elderly abuse. You mentioned, as far as the law is concerned, whether a mandatory reporting mechanism will be set up. I understand the government is looking into it. The police welcomes any initiative that could help better protect um, children, elderly, and other mentally incapacitated persons against abuse. Now, we understand members' concern, especially on child abuse and elderly abuse. We will continue to work with the social welfare department and other relevant uh, stakeholders 
to enhance our effort. We will also work with the Department of Justice to review the existing legislation and see whether we could further enhance our effort. On deception, I mentioned just now that apart from disseminating the message through the media and other channels comprehensively, um, the member asked whether we could enlist the help of district officers and community groups. As you know, in each police district, we have a police uh, public relations office. And as far as deception is concerned, we have been liaising with the district officer and the district office in joint publicity campaigns. You may have heard that we do have a senior police call. And we invite members of the junior police call and senior police call and uh, staff of the district officers to mount joint publicity uh, operations. Ms. Chen Ringen. Thank you, Chairman. I thank the police commissioner for his report. In 2021, the crime figures, when compared to that in 2021, have recorded rise in different areas such as child abuse, deception, and serious um, uh, drugs. So I want to know whether there are measures to combat these crimes, especially child abuse. We understand that uh, children are vulnerable. And I think the children's residential home is just a tip of the iceberg. And the incident wasn't exposed until um, a public complaint was received. Do we have a mechanism to prevent a repeat of this tragedy? And there may be other similar instances going on. Do you have a mechanism to um, pursue complaints and conduct investigation? Police Commissioner, thank you for the question. Indeed, for child abuse cases, uh, it is uh, of our grave concern, and like I explained just now, we'll work with different departments such as NGOs and social welfare department to explore um, ways to enhance prosecution, and we'll also step up uh, internal training for our staff, and there are also uh, areas of work relating to pro uh, enhancing children's welfare internally. We uh, have rolled out a pilot scheme for for courses relating to video interviews with uh, children and MIP or mentally incapacitated persons. This module will be included in um, the courses run by the CIB to enhance the professional skills of our police officers. Apart from uh, our work internally, we'll also explore with other departments. Apart from the Department of Justice and Social Welfare Department, we'll explore other collaborating partners. More importantly, I believe we should raise the public's awareness in general. And I'd like to take this opportunity to encourage the public that if you ever come across a suspected crime, don't hesitate. Please contact us as soon as possible so that we can um, rein uh, people to justice. Finally, uh, it's my time to speak, and I have a short question, Police Commissioner. You may have noticed, Police Commissioner, that uh, people mostly stayed home during Lunar New Year to fight the epidemic. And yet, uh, in different places, uh, including villages, even in uh, urban districts, uh, fire, there were fireworks displayed and the use of firecrackers. That happened even in uh, populated dis urban districts, Asian buildings. And the fireworks displayed lasted for several minutes. Now, my concern is 
that if fireworks are so easily imported into Hong Kong, whether this would pose a safe, um, you know, th whether they would pose a threat. If fireworks are so easily available locally, that means one could uh, take the fire powder out of um, the uh, fireworks to create explosives. And that actually happened during 2019 uh, violence. So would this create a loophole allowing explosives to enter Hong Kong? If bad elements exploit this loophole and import fireworks to create explosives um, to undermine law and order in Hong Kong, how will the police respond to it? Would it be a security loophole? Thank you, Chairman, for your question. We also noticed during Lunar New Year, the illegal uh, fireworks display in different districts and especially in districts close to residential neighborhood or uh, in a case close to a school. In fact, before and during Lunar New Year, so far, six males have been arrested. This morning, we also cracked down on another case with two men arrested. They are suspected of uh, being involved in six cases of possession of illegal fireworks and use of uh, fireworks. We also seized over 1.25 tons of fireworks and firecrackers in these cases. We tackle the situation through various fronts. We work with other departments, for example, apart from working with other local law enforcement agencies, we also keep close liaison with overseas law enforcement agencies. We will step up our presence at sea and exchange of intelligence with a view to tackling the smuggling of uh, fireworks and firecrackers in Hong Kong at source. In addition, we will also try to step up publicity and uh, public education. We will liaise with the uh, fire crime committees and the village representatives uh, so that we will try to promote, uh, distribute pamphlets in the villages and urge the villagers. Uh, it is illegal to keep fireworks and uh, firecrackers. It's a criminal act. On enforcement action, uh, we would try to uh, step up action, especially during the winter months. And for the different police districts, we will try to enhance uh, surveillance and intelligence collection according to the characteristics of the districts. Also, I would like to take this opportunity to appeal to our citizens, uh, please do not try to display fireworks and firecrackers illegally. Even if you have left the scene before the police officers arrived, but then the police will continue to trace you and uh, put you to justice. As I have mentioned, for the six cases, three of them, uh, the people who released the fireworks have left the scene. But then we will try to look at the CCTVs nearby and try to collect information and arrest the people concerned. So we will continue to do so. Chairman, you are also concerned about whether there will be a smuggling of uh, fireworks and firecrackers and they will be used for making explosives and then it may turn out to be uh, terrorist actions. We are also concerned about that. And this year is going to be the 25th anniversary of the establishment of the Hong Kong SAR. So we will try to set up work on intelligence collection. Also, I would like to take this opportunity to urge uh, Hong Kong citizens, if you are aware of anyone who are in possession of uh, fireworks or firecrackers or explosives or guns illegally, please report to us immediately. I think it is a concept that we should all work together to uh, fight against uh, terrorism. 
So we hope that if any citizen is aware of anything suspicious, any suspicious person that you come across, suspicious objects or incidents, please report to us immediately. And it is through your support and participation, then I think we'll be able to combat terrorism and related events. So I think this is a very effective means. As you have heard about the run, hit, and report um, message, it is also a concept that we hope we will all work together to fight terrorism. Please report to us ASAP. Uh, Chairman, I think all of our colleagues who would like to speak have raised their questions. Is there anything that you would like to supplement or uh, do a quick sum up? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I would try to do a quick summary. Uh, especially, I would like to talk about the three aspects of our work. So we will continue to uh, uphold national security and, as I said, involve the community as a whole to fight against uh, terrorism. Also, we will try to focus action on preventing crime and combating crimes. We will focus in this area. Particularly, we will try to focus on issues uh, which affect the livelihood of our citizens. Uh, colleagues have talked about deception cases, dangerous drugs cases. So all these issues will be of uh, top priority, and uh, we will try to collect intelligence and urge uh, citizens to report cases to us. This year, we will also try to focus on thematic crime prevention activities. I have mentioned about them before. Uh, thirdly, we will try to enhance uh, community liaison. We will try to have a proactive and comprehensive uh, community liaison uh, strategy. We will try to liaise with the various uh, stakeholders and we will try to use various channels to help our citizens um, identify uh, fraud cases. And we would try to work with various stakeholders and pay attention to issues of concern to our citizens. As a whole, in 2021, I think our crime situation is stable. And it is sort of uh, of similar scale to other developing cities uh, in around the world. So we do have a rather low crime rate. Uh, the CE election is coming up, and we will try to step up work on intelligence collection, and we will conduct risk assessment and to ensure that the election will be conducted in an orderly and safe manner. In addition, as I have mentioned, uh, there will be security related to the 25th anniversary of the establishment of the Hong Kong SAR. We'll try to work best on that. And I would appeal to our citizens again, if you come across any suspicious person, objects, or activities, please alert us immediately. So I would like to take this opportunity to wish you all the best and good health for the uh, new year. Thank you, Commissioner and colleagues. We will complete discussion of this item. Uh, item 6 is AOB. We don't have any AOB, so meeting adjourned. Thank you.